Hey guys, so I have been shooting with this a7S III for the past few weeks and getting to know the camera and seeing what it can do, seeing what I can get out of it. And I wanna talk about this camera. And first of all, this camera is awesome and it's insane what you get as far as quality out of this camera at this price and in this size. And for the people that this camera is right for, it's amazing and you're going to love it. But I do think that there is going to be a lot of people that this camera isn't right for. And again, that's not that this is a bad camera. It's an awesome camera, but it would be bad to get such an awesome camera if it's not right for you. So I'm going to go through some situations and types of shooters that I think this camera might not be right for. And hopefully this video will help you in choosing if this camera would be a good fit for you or not. So the first group of shooters that I think this camera is definitely not right for is photographers. Even if you're partially photographer and mostly or mainly video shooter, I don't think that this camera can do both for you. And one of the main reasons is that this is a 12 megapixel camera. And it's not that the photos out of this look bad, the photos actually look good, but 12 megapixels is really low resolution. And I know a lot of people have said, well, 12 megapixels is enough for posting on social media or something like that. And that's true, 12 megapixels in and of itself doesn't mean you can't post to social media or something like that, but it doesn't leave any room for editing or working in post on the photo, even for posting for social media. 12 megapixels is very low resolution. With that, there's not enough information to do heavy editing there's really not enough room to be editing and cropping and reframing the image. And I also wouldn't really trust it if you are going to be taking several images and stitching them together in post. It's just not enough information for that kind of work. For me, 18 megapixels is really like the bare minimum threshold of what I could say is kind of professionally viable. And 20 megapixels is really where I would say that's kind of where I would start to feel comfortable as far as resolution in a professional camera. And you might say, well, 12 and 18, that's not that much. But when we really think about it from 12 to 18 megapixels, 18 megapixels is literally 50% more resolution than what 12 megapixels is. And that is a big deal. And again, 18 being my bare minimum threshold for what I would say is professionally viable. Obviously that's up to you and how you do your work, but I really don't think 12 megapixels is going to be enough for anybody doing any type of professional photography. And just to put that into perspective a little bit, 24 megapixels, a lot of people consider to be kind of the sweet spot as being enough resolution to do what you need to do but not be overly huge file sizes for typical photographers. And with 24 megapixels, you can zoom in two times and then still have the same amount of resolution that you have on a 12 megapixel sensor. And just think if you've ever on a 24 megapixel camera zoomed in two times, you're probably already starting to see the lower resolution and quality that you're getting with that. And that's where you start on this sensor. So again, I just don't think it's viable for professional photographers. If you're mainly video shooter and the only thing you need is an unedited thumbnail that you're just gonna shoot in JPEG or something and post right to YouTube for your thumbnail or something like that, yeah, it's gonna be fine. You could also use your phone for that. But if you're doing any kind of professional work, I definitely wouldn't recommend this as a photography camera. The next person that this might be attractive to initially, but I wouldn't really recommend to, is a run and gun filmmaker slash like kind of a one man band type of filmmaker. And the reason is audio. This doesn't really have any professional options for audio. There's no XLR inputs on the body. I will say, of course, Sony does have the adapter for the hot shoe that does allow for two XLR inputs. And while that is very innovative and cool, it's not necessarily, at least right now, the actual best way to handle audio because with the four track audio in this camera, so being able to have two 
audio inputs and backups for those audio inputs which is what you would typically do as a one-man band running gun filmmaker. The problem is that right now editing softwares don't recognize the audio when you have it in the four track audio mode on the a7s3 and while it's very likely that in the future that will become recognizable you typically shouldn't buy gear based on what it might be in the future what software updates might come out in the future again i think it's probably a pretty safe bet that they will fix this at some point but first of all when and then there's always the possibility that it doesn't ever really get fixed and you're always using some kind of workaround to be able to get that audio and use it with your footage. So that's kind of a huge deal breaker if that's something that is very important to your workflow. Another thing with the Hot Shoe XLR unit is that it just adds an extra kind of cumbersome, awkward, step in building out the rig and being able to use XLR inputs with this camera. And if you're very run and gun, that difference of just a few seconds even can potentially be a deal breaker and potentially cause you to miss shots in certain environments. Another thing that I'll say is Sony also has the shotgun mic that connects just through the hot shoe on the a7S III or other Sony cameras. And that is a really cool, really innovative idea as well. The problem is that only solves the problem of an on-camera mic. So if you're doing something where you're trying to boom your audio or a lavalier mic or basically any kind of other solution that doesn't help in that situation. So if you are that kind of one man band filmmaker or running gun filmmaker and the type of films that you make rely on getting good audio from the situation that you're filming in, I would say it's probably not the best bet. Another feature that this camera as a dedicated video camera is missing from something like cinema cameras is that a lot of, especially the cinema cameras from Sony and Canon will have some type of built-in ND filters and this camera doesn't have that. Which means, especially if you're changing lenses, you're going to have to have ND filters either with step up, step down rings that you can attach to the different lenses or just have ND filters for each lens. And that can definitely make switching lenses and being adaptable to the situation a lot slower, a lot more difficult. And the biggest downside for a one man band or running gun type of filmmaker that I see with this camera is honestly the fact that it can't record proxies to a second card. You can only record proxies to the same card that you're recording the main video to. And that makes the cards that you can use even more restricted and just slows down and restricts when proxies can be used. And for most of this footage, you're probably going to need to be making proxies and it would make it much easier if you could just do that in camera to a second card and then not have to worry about that extra step of making proxies on your computer and would make the workflow a lot easier. And for me, it just seems like this is something that could have been done through software and for whatever reason, they decided not to. The next group of people that I'm gonna say this camera might not actually work for is probably the main market that it's aimed at, which is run and gun videographers, people that don't need pro audio going into the camera. So people that are filming 4K 120 and you're gonna underlay music or something like that, so you don't need the actual audio from the room or whatever you're filming. So you don't need those professional inputs for audio necessarily, then it seems like this starts to make sense. The thing that kind of holds it back in this category is again, the codex and the file sizes, because typically as a running gun videographer, you're churning out content pretty fast. There's usually a high turnaround rate as far as how fast you need to get that video out. And this camera is very restrictive for that Really because of the quality of image that you're getting, it's great video and great quality, but the file sizes with that, especially for doing it through a small mirrorless camera like this, make it really slow in 
post and processing, editing, rendering these videos, and it's gonna slow down that a lot, and it might not be a viable option for people who are running gun videographers just because of the slow workflow. The next group of people that I probably wouldn't recommend this for is content creators, YouTubers, vloggers. And while I think that this is actually like a really cool camera to use for that, the flip screen makes it awesome. Video quality is again, amazing. I feel like I sound like a broken record at this point, but the post workflow is just way too slow for someone that needs to be uploading and putting out new content constantly. And I think for content creators that end up buying this camera, what they're going to end up doing is filming most of their content in 1080. And then you're missing out on all of the benefits of why this camera is priced out, why it is. And then it just makes sense to go for a much cheaper camera because you're doing 1080 quality video anyway. So while I think, again, this would produce amazing content for a content creator, I don't think that the workflow with this camera makes sense for that type of creator. The next group of people that this might not fit for is people that need raw video. And the a7S III does have 16-bit raw external output, which is crazy, but it's ProRes RAW. And ProRes RAW doesn't give you as much flexibility in what you can change as far as ISO white balance and that kind of stuff as some of the other raw codecs do. So first of all, I would say that most people looking at this camera probably don't need to shoot in raw. And the 10 bit footage that's coming out of this camera is probably more than a lot of people that are looking at this camera really need. So raw is just an extra step with even more slow and difficult workflow than the 10 bit footage that they'll probably be more than happy with once they see it. But if you do need RAW for specific reasons, it's very possible that ProRes RAW doesn't actually check off the boxes of what you need from RAW. And while we're talking about RAW, the camera itself is capable of outputting 16 bit RAW, but your only option is like Atomos Ninja 5 and that can only receive and record the 12 bit RAW signal. So it's down sampling it down 12 bit, which 12 bit raw is crazy. That's what something like the C200 does for instance. But it's also external. You're not getting the full benefit of the 16 bit raw yet in the future. Again, here's an instance where the technology kind of has to catch up to this camera a little bit. You're not getting the full 16 bit raw at this point. 12 bit raw, again, awesome. But you're also reliant on getting that over HDMI and the good thing is this camera does have a full size HDMI port. So that's going to be a little bit more reliable and sturdy than like a micro HDMI or something, but it's still just one cable that you're reliant on that can be bumped or knocked or fall out. And if that's in a situation where you really have to get the footage and you only have one shot to do it, that's a lot that's riding on that one cable staying in place. So again, I wanna say that this is an amazing camera. And one thing I didn't mention in all of those sections is that this is pretty hands down the best option for an extreme low light camera. But that is a pretty specialty situation. And the thing is, if none of the drawbacks affect you and your workflow, this is an awesome camera and I think you would love it. But you have to kind of objectively look at what you need and whether this camera fits into that or not. And if it does, awesome camera, and I highly recommend it. But if it doesn't, it doesn't matter how great the camera is if it doesn't fit into your workflow. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you're interested in seeing more content, I am gonna be making more content about the A7S III over the next few weeks. Hit the subscribe button so that you can keep up with all that videos and get notified when it comes out. If you are interested in buying this camera or any of the other gear that I've talked about throughout the video, I will have affiliate links in the description below. At no extra cost to you, if you buy through those links, you'll help support this channel so that I can keep making videos for you guys. 
If you enjoyed it, like I said, give it a thumbs up. Let me know in the comments below what you think about this camera, what you're potentially thinking about using it for, how you think it would fit into your workflow. If you haven't yet, like I said, hit the subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you guys.